Hi, it's Jeff Chalmers here from discoverdoublebass.com, which is the home of online lessons for the double bass. So if you want to study something new, you want to take your playing further, please go and check out our website. Now, today in this lesson, we're continuing with our new series where we ask questions to the world's greatest bass players, and we're back with the legends of jazz double bass. Here's the question. Can you recommend a favorite exercise which has really helped you over the years? In a previous interview with Jeff on Discover Double Bass, I mentioned an exercise that I have been doing over the years with scales and improvising my fingerings, going up one way, go back down another fingering, go up another way, back down another way, over and over, and find multiple fingerings to the same scale. I found over the years that this really helped me to look at the fingerboard in a more, more holistic way of making my way through the instrument um, much more comfortably. I think, you know, we, we, we have certain habits that we can fall into on the double bass where we go up to the G string, up the G string, down the G string, across. You know, that's one way. There are so many ways to play through the instrument and utilize the full spectrum of sound that's available to us. And I think especially as a, as a jazz bass player where we're not sure what's going to come up next musically, we have to be very flexible uh, with our movements through the instrument. I felt that this exercise really helped me a lot to feel more comfortable in all the areas of the, of the bass. So you can practice this on any type of scale. You could do it on arpeggios, but the idea is to really explore and see what different fingerings do and see if you might be avoiding certain fingerings on the bass because you're just not super comfortable in that area of the bass. So it's really showing us very clearly which parts of the instrument we, we might need to spend more time on, which I find really valuable. One of my favorite exercises is playing on one string, which will open up your bass lines incredibly so, and they become a lot more linear. One of the things I discovered was, by doing this, I had a lot of bass students would come and they were saying that their bass lines were, uh, they felt they were in a rut. They, they were playing these kind of, um, uh, they said, boring bass lines. I, but I really feel if they're satisfying what the music requires, that, that's good. But there are ways to actually enhance your lines, if you think more linearly, using more chromaticism, uh, etc., and arrival points, departures, etc. So, uh, but playing on this bass, um, this was an exercise that I thought was really great. So it started like being able to play um, not on the G string. This is an exercise you don't ever play on the G string because by when you, when it's time to get on the G string, it feels like a holiday. So. Um, First thing I would ask certain players to come in, and I said, can you play me a chromatic scale on the D string in, in two octaves? And, uh, oh yeah, sure, and they, I said, well, but wait, no, just play slow, but really be conscious of your pitch, and in two octaves, go all the way to the end of the foot fingerboard. Then all of a sudden I said, yes, you go up there into what what has been known as no man's land. Um, and we don't tend to know how to get there. There's that transition area that helps us get there. But I'm actually working on the, uh, let's see if we can just get a sound. Because if you actually make a sound up here and feel comfortable up here, you might be able to utilize it in, in a musical context. Uh, so, you 
yourself with the harmonic. Now, don't think of it as a scale, but it's a chromatic scale. It will help your pitch. And then sometimes you could go... So now, if you begin to really get comfortable up there, then put the metrodome, metronome on slowly until you're actually able to get a good sound. But if you spend enough time here, not just a couple minutes, like if you actually went for like five minutes a day. Now this is just one way to play the scale fingering-wise. I, it's uh, as it comes. play harmonics with this not with the scale then go chip 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 come back now you can play your major scales minor scales diminished scales, whole tone scales, so that you become comfortable, but you concentrate on the sound that you're making. And eventually, you can actually play a blues. So let's say you, you, you can play a B-flat blues using all four strings. Great. I'm suggesting that you play your blues and alternate every chorus go to one string, all four strings, one string, all four strings. I would not be able to tell you exactly what I play because I'm, uh, if my life depended on it, because I'm not thinking, I'm thinking about trying to satisfy the sound of the blues, but only on one string. And then you begin to become a lot more agile, and your harmonic, uh, your information, because I guarantee you, you will enter into some areas that you didn't really plan to do, but you have to somehow finalize and satisfy that phrase. This is what Bach did with this cello suites. He, he didn't play any chords, maybe a couple double stops, maybe a triple stop somewhere, but pretty much at the end. But you hear harmony everywhere. So I really feel if he were alive today, he would be a great improviser at, in the jazz sense, because he was an improviser. But um, this is what we do as jazz bassists, and I 
really think if you actually spend some time just being able to play the chromatic scale without hiccuping and then speed the tempo up but the sound never suffers and then eventually <laughs> begin to have a lot more freedom to open up your lines. I think one of the most helpful exercises that I learned was one that I learned from listening to Ray Brown. He never said to me, do this, but I heard him do it and I thought, oh, I need to be comfortable with that. <laughs> So it's turned out to be a, a cool exercise for me. And I, I just, I take triads or chords, dominant chords, whatever kind of chords, and play them around the cycle, and around the cycle of fifths or cycle of fourths, however you like to refer to that. Uh, so I will play uh, C and B flat. see I I mix up the octaves and I don't always just go I don't keep just you know ascending starting on the root so that keeps it interesting and fun because I can do same thing with my etc so that's one of the most helpful exercises that I do I use I play that just to get my hands on the instrument and make some music and have some fun playing it it's, it's a kind of cool exercise. I like that one. Uh, so as far as exercises that, that have helped me over the years, one that I've been use, doing for, for, for many, many years, and I, you know, I, I have all my students do it as well, is uh, um, major scales, minor scales, uh, a major bebop scale, major dominant scales. You can use also diminished scale, uh, pentatonic scales, whatever scales that you're into, it can be like really exotic uh, ethnic scales as well. But to play those scales, three octaves with three different fingerings on the bass. So if, for instance, if I'm taking a, a, the major scale, I'll play the major scale, three octaves, uh, up and down with one fingering, then I'll do another fingering of the major scale, then I'll do another finger, I'll do three fingerings. And there's even, if you want to be even more, uh, um, experiment more and, 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 and try to learn more. There's way more than three, three ways to finger a scale on the bass. So, so like, uh, but, but, but to start with three, that, that's a lot. So three, three actors, three fingerings, and then I do exercises based off of that. Uh, uh, two note patterns, three note patterns, four note patterns, all of that stuff based off of the, the, the concept of three actors with three different fingerings. And that's great exercise. Can you recommend a favorite exercise <clears throat> which has really helped you over the years? Push-ups. <laughs> no. Um, I'm an intonation freak, so for me, playing in tune was vitally important. And when I was younger, I was totally threatened and intimidated by thumb position. And it took me a while to get comfortable. And then I realized, well, if you play here, it's half the distance of here. So in a sense, it's actually easier. The hard part is, is you have to move your arm up here and and it's kind of intimidating and scary. But um, so exercises, I think one of the biggest, most important exercises for me was really simple, really basic, but it was about shifting from 
regular positions down here on the neck up to thumb position, which was, I would just do little things like, you know. Things like that. And I would get used to Scales are your friend. I would play scales and I would really, really work on getting from here to here. Because the transition, if that transition is smooth, um, it, it becomes seamless and it's much easier for you to go in a thumb position if you're thinking something melodically. You know, when, when I play, I, I hear what I play and, and if I'm singing and I want to go up here, I don't want the, the, the my limitation on the instrument to stop me from what I hear. If I hear something, I want to be able to play it. I don't want to be like, oh man, I can't go up there. Oh no, man, I'm freaked out, you know. So for me, it was about getting comfortable in the jump to thumb position. So I would do exercises like that. Other things, you know, again, as I said before, I grew up playing drums. So time is important. Cleanliness is important. So if I was doing some technical, you know, stupid stuff or whatever, like, you know, whatever, just some kind of cool vibe, I would really work on making sure that the rhythm was totally clear and even. Every note I would really focus on it, making sure it didn't just sound like a whole bunch of noise. So things like that, you start slow, but those are the kind of exercises of... So when you're walking, when you're doing a triplet, it's really clear and really precise. That's the drummer in me. And then when you do sessions, um, you play the click track a lot, so you have to be nailed. So if you're going to do something, you still want to make it human, you want to make it swing, and you want to make it feel good, but the time has to be right. So I would work on those kind of things and try to make it very clear and precise and make the rhythm very clear and precise. It's really important. You know, being a drummer, I want that bass player to be on it, you know, because that quarter note is it. Quarter note is everything. So if, if your time isn't on it or you're trying to do a lick and you get screwed up, there goes the groove, you know, you got to nail it. So I would work on things like that just with a, with a metronome or click track to make sure that I was very even and clear and clean and precise. Because if I'm messed up, anybody that's going to be playing with me is also going to be messed up and I don't want that experience. And I want them to love playing with me so they want to play with me again. You know, you want to earn a living too, you know, so... Um, so those are the kind of exercises, just things that I would challenge myself with just to, uh, you know, get around the instrument more efficiently and really concentrate on that intonation. So many great players, so many famous players that I love their playing, but they play out of tune and they don't correct. They'll play a note and when you play a note and you're out of tune, you have the time to fix it. If you, and you stay there, that's a problem. But if you play out and you fix it, Cool. So many guys, their intonation is secondary to their art or their vibe. To me, they go hand in hand. You know, um, you've got to play in tune. So uh, you've got to learn how to correct when you hear something's out, move your finger. It's really simple. If you're out, move your finger. Correct it. Everybody will love you for it. I guess I, I have a, 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 a very, very low bastard version of perfect pitch. So... Um, I know when I'm out of tune and I learned how to correct it quickly. I don't have the rocket science perfect pitch and in a way I'm, I'm actually really happy I don't because you have a hard time in, in life. I have friends that have perfect pitch that, that's like, you know, you could go to a piano and just go and they'll tell you every single note. Like bam, 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 bam. It's, it's ridiculous. I can't do that. But I, I have enough of it to know if I'm out that I instantly correct it. These are things that... Uh, it's still part of exercise. It's these are things that I would still work on to work on your intonation. Favorite exercise? Wow, too many. Uh, there's definitely a lot of them with the metronome. You know, setting the the beat, one beat in a bar, and having to walk, 
or play two beat or solo or um, uh, setting that at a slow tempo where you only get one beat per bar or one beat every two bars if it's a faster tempo, one beat every four bars if it's really up tempo. Practicing drums. Also being able to keep a solid quarter note with the ride cymbal and working out playing triplet figures with the hi-hat, the snare drum, and the bass drum. That's something that'll help your time uh, no matter what instrument you play, but it's certainly great for the bass player to understand how drummers do what they do. A good exercise that I like to do um, that, that, that I've been doing for a while, there are two of them. One is my right hand uh, exercise, and, and the reason why I focus on that is because the job that I have with the Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra is demanding in terms of uh, strength endurance, and we, we as bass players have to find ways to, to not hurt ourselves. I mean, we've heard these many stories of great bass players who, who fall into these uh, rabbit holes and, and, and get tendonitis, hurt their fingers, calluses are all over the place. So what I tend to do when I practice, and this I've been doing this for quite a long time, is I mute the strings with my left hand and then I play with my right. And I try to create a boxy sound to fill up the cavity of the bass because I have a concept that since the cavity fills up with sound and air, um, air has to pump out of these F holes somehow for you to hear the thump and the woof of the sound. It's not only the string on the fingerboard, it's also the cavity of the bass that has to be filled out so you can hear it. It's almost like a subwoofer. And if you can analyze that as you practice, you can kind of get a sense and practice that thumpiness to fill up the cavity of the bass. Now remember, that this will coincide with your left hand because also having a strong uh, left hand will enhance that sound, you know? So it's almost like having two microphones. It's almost like having a tube mic that specializes on the depth and centered sound of the bass and then another mic with a smaller diaphragm that probably concentrates on the higher frequency or the more direct sound. So I, f I think of that. When I practice with my right hand, I tend to put on a metronome uh, at 70, and I just do quarter notes, eighth notes, straight. I do triplets, and then I go to 16 notes. And I do it with all the strings. I even do it on the E string. And the E string is harder because it's a, it's a bigger string and it likes to flap. Now I have a method where I, I tend to pull the string out. Uh, people who know me have seen me do that. And, and it's, it's, not a, it's not a new uh, technique. Uh, many bass players in, uh, in the 30s and 40s with gut strings will, will play it out because the string action was higher, uh, because they needed tension. The only reason why the string action was higher is they needed tension with the gut strings. And then you get that thump, thump, thump sound. Um, with, the modern day setup, you can kind of obtain a certain sound like that and kind of combine them both. And that's my concept. So that's one practice that I would do. And you do it, you know, until you can get it fast, you know. You know, on the E string is hard, right? And I'm playing on top of the string so you understand the concept here in this exercise is that you, you challenge yourself to play on top of the string as you move from string to string because you teach yourself not to depend on the fingerboard because m most modern day bass players tend to pull the string downwards and, and rest their finger on the fingerboard. But what happens if you're on a gig and the rental bass is, the actions are real high, uh, you know, the setup is not the one you have at home. So if you could just concentrate on the strings, you could enable yourself to kind of put yourself in a position where you could control it. So that, that's a practice that I would do. And, um, you know, I would do that practice and, and you know, don't kill yourself. It's a, it's a matter of building muscles, right? You know, this is like lifting weights. You, you gotta start slow and you gotta build up. The next one is I do an interval practice with my left hand uh, to gain strength. And at the same time, it helps me locate notes as I move from half position maybe up to seventh position. So I'll start off with a ninth, a six, and a flat six, 
and then continue that pattern. This is what it sounds like. A ninth, a six, a flat six. Ninth, six, flat six, ninth, six, flat six. And then we go backwards. try to do that and obtain the uh, best sound that's even and what we try to do or what I try to do is I try to incorporate once you get your left hand different um, right hand motion so right and change it Therefore, it changes. You change it. And, and you're trying to, what I do with this practice is I try to obtain a real clear sound. And um, that, that's basically what I, I try to do that every day. And, uh, and the key is not to play hard. You know, as a young bass student, it was, I, was, I always had a reverse uh, uh, thinking of this. I thought that, you know, playing hard was the right thing, but it's not. You have to feather it in a way where you could optimize the, the, the best sound, the loudest sound that you can get, and you could fill the wave in the cavity. So that, that takes time to understand. So one exercise I like to do is to do with triads and their inversions. It's really important as a bass player to really know all your inversions so that you can have control and clarity with the harmony when you're creating bass lines, creating walking lines, and even when you're soloing. So this is just a simple exercise with F major triad and we're going to displace the second note up one octave. So it's just one, five, three, three, one, five, five, three, one, one, five, three, three, five, one, and then back down. with a metronome exercise and one thing I like to do is put up beats on and you're responsible for the down beats so one two three four step further and apply it to some tunes. You can take it to maybe just even a simple progression like a 1, 6, 2, 5. If you've got one major, 6 dominant, 2 minor, 5 dominant. So if we're starting with F, we can go... Now if we're thinking of 6 dominant, we've got D dominant 7. So in terms of triads, we could play the closest possible note, which is in the D triad, which would be... And then you have G minor 7, so the closest possible triad is probably 1, one five, 3. Now you have C7, which is the 5 chord, and then you're thinking the triad of C, which is the closest one would be to stay on the G. So we're thinking inversions, but whichever one is the closest. Chord is B flat minor seven. 
So the closest triad there would be second version B flat minor. So. Next chord is E flat seven. So the closest triad there will be E flat first version, and then you resolve to A flat major seven. So the closest triad there will be A flat major. So all the things you wrote will sound like. So getting to know more of your inversions, your triads, and applying them maybe to a metronome exercise or a tune that you're working on. So what did you think? I really hope that you enjoyed it. Stuff like this, I, I just absolutely love. I really want to know what everybody is practicing. So to be able to get into the minds of people like, well, the people that we've just seen is really a true privilege. So thank you so much to everybody who contributed and thank you for watching at home. Practice hard and we'll see you in the next video.